All right. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so uh, thrilled to be helping close this next session. And uh, it has really been amazing to watch this innovation school evolve and scale and uh, and adjust to your local needs. So I'm just blessed that I was part of founding it with Karen and Lucien uh, and uh, to share some reflections. So what I'm going to do today is uh, a few different topics uh, that you know, cover a few aspects of what I'm doing that I think could be useful to you. One is just some reflections on this word business model innovation, um, because I actually think that's the work that's left to be done in, in healthcare innovation, because, uh, you know, even normal innovation is very hard, but business model innovation is to me what's necessary. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what I've been up to since um, coming back to Canada from Netherlands in 2017. And then just a quick overview of a, a book we wrote. We, we released it in February of this year. I was supposed to come to the Netherlands as part of my book tour in June, uh, and I had to cancel. So this is uh, my book tour in like two slides. Um, of course, uh, go ahead and ask questions. I'll try to monitor the chat. If I can't, Karen or Evelyn or someone just cut me off and ask questions. But we will be doing a little bit of an exercise. So get ready with your computer. Um, and uh, and then, or just kind of raise your hand. So um, just a reminder for those of you who don't know me. So first of all, yes, this is my natural hair color now. Uh, thank you, COVID. <laughs> I have to change my picture. Um, but uh, I came for one year on a, a sabbatical to the Netherlands uh, to work uh, based out of uh, Radboud UMC, but I also worked with Karen uh, in the Ministry of Health and that's where we developed and launched the first cohort of the Innovation School. Some of you on this call were part of the first class. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, again, it's just been amazing how far it's gone. I used my year in the Netherlands to just take a break from all the things above the line there that I was doing. And I was very busy and involved in a lot of things. And sometimes you just have to get away from it to see what you really want to do with the rest of your life. So I'm Lebanese, one of our quotes from one of our philosophers, Khalil Gibran is, you know, the mountain is clearer to the climber when they step off and look from the plane. And so the year away really for me, uh, helped me understand what do I wanna really do and what's my superpower. So I came back with intention to work on the future of elderly care in the home and community, because that's the future of health, is getting out of buildings, out of facilities, and really um, maximizing the health span of, of our population to meet, to meet their lifespan. And so that's what I do. So we're a national uh, nonprofit social enterprise, St. Elizabeth Healthcare. And I lead uh, not the innovation team because I, again, I find in healthcare, when we say innovation, then most people just think of small things like digital. Uh, uh, we're the futures team because we're really trying to build the future. Okay, so this word innovation, I think you probably know, uh, it has origins that um, go back really far. So the reason we say innovation is from the word nova. Uh, and, and that came from law in the 13th century because when lawyers were trying to help people who invented something new to protect that invention, they had to come up with a language to describe what is something so new and so different from everything else. And that's where they said it's a novation. And then now we just say innovation. And, and I think that's the, the core aspect of what, when you're doing real innovation, that's what you're doing. It's got to be very, very new and different from before. But that's not enough because that's basically just an invention. Um, the, the other part of the definition of innovation is it has to create value. It has to deliver some kind of an impact and some kind of a result. And I find, especially because we use the metaphor of a light bulb in healthcare or in all innovation, uh, that, that still emphasizes in our brain that the most important part of innovation is the big idea, the eureka, the invention, just like Thomas Edison with the light bulb. And I think that's done a real, it's a real problem because then we stop thinking about uh, as much energy on how are we going to actually create value from that problem? And so when I was at Mars, our, our, our arithmetic for innovation was innovation is the invention plus the adoption. And if you don't have the two together, it's not going to work. And you, you have to have a full methodology for both of these things. 
And most people, you know, um, spend 99% of their energy on invention or design and coming up with the idea uh, or the solution. And then they just assume it's, it's going to adopt itself because it's so great. Um, so uh, a, a key thing too is what does it mean to be adopted? We usually say it's uh, at scale or we say to a meaningful extent or in normal words, a lot. But remember that means about 33% of the new of the of people or practice is the new thing. Not 100%, not 50%, around 33%. Once you get over that tipping curve, it'll go. That's the hardest part of innovation. So just, you know, I like to kind of use this uh, grid of, you know, when are you talking about innovation and when are you not? So the, on the one axis on the horizontal is how much did you implement? So adoption uh, and impact. And then the other is how new it is. How different is what you're doing from the old way things used to be done? And reminder, in healthcare, some of the old ways we do things are 150 years old. Like we have not had change in a lot of things for a very, very long time. So the amount of undoing of the old is, is huge. And that's a lot of what uh, Helen just talked about this morning. So, you know, if, if you're doing something that doesn't get implemented and it's not new, then you're what I call inept. Like just stop what you're doing and go, you know, work somewhere else. <laughs> uh, if you uh, did something very, very new, like you figured out how to tell a whole port your doctor into your living room, uh, but you didn't implement it, then you just made an invention. That's it. Uh, if you uh, develop something new, but it's uh, sorry, and you didn't invent it, but you know, but it's different, but it's not really completely new. You're just being creative. If you develop, if you implement something, but it's not that new, all you did was make what you used to do a little bit better. That's just improvement. That's quality improvement. And then innovation is that tough stuff in the in the top right, right? Implementation, and it's a big difference from the status quo. So there are lots of different types of innovation and lots of frameworks, and I've shared some of them in previous classes of this course. Um, you know, I'm just using this one that I used to use when I was with Boston Consulting Group that we used to simplify things for organizations. You know, either you're doing a process innovation, uh, a product or a service, that's what most of us are used to, like a new care model or a new technology. Uh, the hard stuff is towards the bottom, which is, you know, business model innovation, where you're really completely changing all a lot of elements of how you used to do things and putting them together in a new way to unlock new value. And then there's kind of the holy grail, which we used to call that adaptation that companies like Virgin and some of Elon Musk's companies can do, where really they can move from selling cell phones to healthcare, to uh, airplanes, <laughs> to spaceships. You know, they're really a platform that just keeps reinventing itself um, instead of adding new value in the same sector. So uh, like I said, I think that business model innovation uh, is the unfinished business of healthcare. It's, it's, you know, we have spent a lot of energy and effort and training and courses and conferences on innovation. I think it's becoming kind of normal, finally, in healthcare. Like I always said, quality improvement went on its own journey to become just a normal capability in healthcare. I think innovation is there now, and I think the innovation school has been a big part of that in the Netherlands. But but now we got to go a lot deeper on, on business model innovation. And, and let me explain that. So first, there's the textbook definition. So you, you guys might know Alex Osterwalder. He's from Switzerland. He's probably the top global um, a knowledge holder, thinker, influencer on what does it mean to do a business model? How do you change it? But his work really applies to every industry. It's not healthcare specific. And it's a very complicated textbook definition. I like this definition. This is from our friends at um, a nonprofit in America that just focuses on business model innovation for education, healthcare, and public goods. So really your business model is a story. It's very important. It's a story of how your organization creates value, delivers value, and captures value. So we're gonna talk about those three words. So. Uh, in the in the business innovation factories framework, this is their um, definition of a business model. It has three parts. 
it has the uh, the customer experience you're creating. That's where the value is, the, the new value proposition. That's why you do human-centered design and you figure out needs and you do co-design and you, you write a value proposition statement. That's the new thing. Uh, but it has to work with an operating model. That's your resources, your capabilities, your processes, your IT systems, all the, the machine that makes it work. And then the only way you can deliver that at scale uh, is if you have a, a financial model that is sustainable, that, you know, you can have a way to cover your costs. And if you're a for-profit, you know, make the profit you need to be able to keep your business going so you have more investment for the future. So that's all the money stuff. So remember the definition, create value, right? So a business model is a story of how an organization creates value. That's all this stuff. That's probably what you did a lot in your projects in the innovation school delivers value that's how you execute that's how you implement that's the delivery part and capture value is the financial model uh, whether that's a profit model or a non-profit model but how is it sustainable it's so simple this way and it's amazing how few people think about all three of these at the same time and so what's business model innovation remember nova <laughs> all your business model innovation is a new way to create value, deliver value, and capture value. Um, and so now we're gonna kind of get into a bit of a practice and see some good examples of business model innovation. And I wanna see with you, how are they making you think about a new way to create, deliver, and capture value? So uh, I sometimes like to use this um, comparison of the different types of change we try to do in, in healthcare or in any organization. You know, and over time, if you do nothing, you know, your value stays the same. In my opinion, it actually goes down. That's the red curve. If every now and then your organization decides you're going to do a, an improvement project, you know, once a year or something, that's kind of the steps in, in purple. Um, you know, some organizations are very good at continuous improvement. They have a good cycle. That's great. But really, the, you know, innovation and with that business model innovation is about big jumps, big steps of new value, and then you improve and make it better. Then new value, then you improve and make it better. That's how you get to the kind of return that society needs, frankly, in healthcare. Um, and I always say, if you're working in innovation, you should be targeting five times or better, uh, you know, patient experience, health outcomes, cost savings, whatever your metric, five times or better. Most improvement activities, you're looking at 20 or 30%, so 0.2 times or 0.3 times or better. That's the kind of impact we're talking if you're trying to really break away from um, uh, the status quo. And the status quo, there's so much to do there, and it'll always have a lot of effort. It takes a lot of courage to step out and try to go for the big problems. So I want to do a little example. I've put, you know, five or six examples of big massive hairy problems that I think every country in the world is struggling with in public health. So, you know, smoking rates, depending on the country, continue to be at 30%. And in most places, they're on the rise because of vaping. Obesity rates are on the rise. Loneliness, alcohol use, sleep deprivation, and then even some medical things like just screening rates and compliance. And, you know, if we added COVID, we'd have 100 more. I'm not going to assign, but just Pick one of these or a problem you're working on that continues to have a curve that goes down red. So even doing nothing or doing what we've always done or all of our attempts, it's still getting worse. <laughs> it's not getting better, right? And we're going to take some inspiration and just see, can we think of some new ways to do business model innovation um, uh, to unlock new value, okay? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to very quickly go through what I call my inspiration gallery of business model innovations from other industries, mostly. And we don't, you don't need to learn them or understand them. I'm just going to go quick. And what I want as I go through, everybody, as I go through one, think of one that you hear it and you say, oh, I'm going to apply that concept to my problem. So first, does everybody have an issue? Smoking, sleep, whatever you work on, care of the elderly, it doesn't matter. And now I'm going to go through my gallery. And at the end, I wanted to see some ideas. 
If while I'm going through one of the examples, you have an idea right away, put it in the chat because or else you're going to forget <laughs> by the time I get to the last one. Of course, you're going to have all these slides. And, and I think I use this technique in workshops with healthcare people all the time because it helps their brain think very differently. Okay, the first business model innovation that's very popular right now is that uh, the product you give, whether it's a physical product or a service, is not what you sell, it's the data. The data is the business model. The product or the service is free. So, you know, there's a, a cafe uh, in uh, Japan that students pay because they're giving away their personal data. That's how they buy their coffee. They agree to share their social media patterns. They don't pay for their coffee. Uh, uh, there's a lot of DNA companies that do your genetic test. So before, you know, you guys know the human genome costed about $3 billion to sequence 15 years ago. It's now like $1,000. Uh, well, some companies will do the genome test for you for free, but you give your data and then they give it to science. And then if a researcher or a pharma company uses your genetic data, you get paid because you help them develop a product very different business model. And then uh, Culture is an amazing company that, you know, you let them track your patterns of using Amazon or Hulu or Netflix or Spotify, and they pay you every time they sell that data to, uh, a, you know, a, a broadcaster or a company. And they had in their first week, 4 million people gave away their data and th they got on average $100 each cash just for using, you know, social, okay? So is there an idea there? Next one. This is a cafe chain in Russia um, where you don't pay for coffee or anything you eat. You pay by the minute when you sit in a chair in the coffee shop. I shouldn't say coffee shop. I know what that means in the Netherlands <laughs> as I drink my coffee from the Netherlands. Um, but, you know, we have that in, in North America. Starbucks is we say it's an office that sells coffee. People go there all day and work, and then they just buy some coffee. So Starbucks should be charging you for the time you're in the store, not you know when you buy the cappuccino. So that's a different business model. The third one, I don't know if you guys, um, I know when I lived in the Netherlands to go to IKEA, we had to drive to, uh, um, uh, where did we go? I, I forget where, but there wasn't one in Nijmegen. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, driving and parking, and it was a big problem. There was no way, place to put it. In Dubai, nobody wants to drive to Ikea because it's too far away. So what they do is they use the GPS to calculate how long you drove. And then based on the average hourly wage, they take that price off of your bill <laughs> because they're giving you money back for the time. Imagine if in healthcare, we got our money back for all of our waiting are waiting for a specialist. I just heard that, you know, and here we wait on average six months to see a specialist. New business model. Okay, a huge business model innovation is do it yourself. So there's a lot of things that we thought that us stupid citizens, you know, there's no way we could know how to do. Uh, this kid in the US 3D printed his own teeth braces for $60 instead of spending 5,000 US dollars. Uh, the Netherlands is the most famous, of course, for uh, people making their own power and then selling that on the grid. So that just eliminated the power company. And then Amazon is now launching uh, grocery stores. Uh, so like Albert Hein, where uh, there's no humans in the store uh, selling you anything. You, you do everything yourself and you never, you know, you just... You just take it off and you put it in your bag and you leave. You don't have to check out in the self-checkout aisle, right? So there's so much possibility for do-it-yourself in, in healthcare. Okay, next one. Reimagine institutions that have not changed for hundreds of years, like school. So in uh, San Diego, there's a school, public school, called Design 39 that has a completely new philosophy. There's no grade levels. There's no first grade, second grade, third grade. You just move between whatever, wherever you're at. Nobody is called a teacher. That word does not exist. They're called learning experience designers. Imagine if we had no doctors, but we had, I don't know what you call them, health experience designers. Um, uh, students are put into pods. 
Uh, and it's just a, a completely different philosophy. And everybody will look at this and tell you every reason why it won't work, but it's working. Okay, next one, subscription business model. So we love paying per, you know, by the visit, by the pill, by the hour. That's our, that business model in healthcare hasn't changed in 150 years. We're starting to see interesting experiments with a subscription, just like you pay for a Spotify subscription. So this interesting one in the U.S., Cengage, I don't know if in the Netherlands is the same, but there's a crazy industry here in North America for students and university to sell them their textbooks. And it's, it's so much money. And so now they have all the textbooks and you can just pay $180 a year and you subscribe to the textbooks. That's about uh, 20 times cheaper than what it normally costs. Uh, Volvo, as you likely know, uh, launched a subscription model for cars. You do not buy a car. You subscribe to a car service, but you get to keep the car. Uh, you know, you can get generic drugs for $5 a month in the U.S. as a subscription. And then in the U.S., Panera launched a subscription service for coffee, $9 per month, unlimited coffee. This business would die in the Netherlands, I know, but this is how it is there. So again, how can we think about uh, a paying a recurring fee and pooling that revenue instead of paying by the service? Another big shift is instead of paying for uh, activities, procedures, admissions in healthcare, you, you pay for the result, you pay for the health. So this idea of fee for result, pay for performance, there's all these words. In, in Netherlands, I know you did a lot of work with impact bonds. You're basically paying all or some of the payment for a service or a product uh, only if there's a result demonstrated, health. Um, so, uh, you know, lots of examples of this in pharma with Roche and Novartis and many companies where uh, the pharma company only gets paid if blood sugar goes down or obesity goes down or whatever, instead of getting paid every time the patient swallows the pill. Um, uh, there's lots going on now with obesity management, coaching, weight loss, exercise, where the, the um, usually digital health company only gets paid when the when the patient or the client um, achieves a health outcome. And currently most software companies, you know their business model is pay for, per user per month. It's a pay per service. Uh, another one in the US is um, instead of paying for your university tuition, you only pay if you get a good job. So if you don't get a good job after all the university, you don't have to pay for your tuition. That, that really aligns the incentives for the educator. And then finally, you guys know better than me how um, much your political candidates give you all these promises before they get elected. Uh, I don't know if you have as much of this in Europe, but in North America, uh, they get people to pay money to you know, be part of a political campaign. This was big with Trump <laughs> recently. So they have some politicians are now saying, if you give me money to help me run for president or, or prime minister, and I don't achieve the things I said, I have to pay you back. Right, so that's the idea there. Okay, last few, uh, disincentives. So there's a lot of ideas out there in terms of you know like a gym membership where uh, you get paid back your fees if you show up at the gym, right? So now it's kind of like a disincentive, maybe it's an incentive. And, and I love this uh, example from China where you know the emperor had like a doctor, but the doctors are only paid uh, when the emperor was healthy. Because um, uh, if they were sick, then the doctor wasn't doing their job. So it's different than getting paid when you, you know, do your procedures and your checkups and your all that stuff. Okay, another uh, business model innovation is what I call the pivot, where um, whatever you used to be doing, you know, is not really uh, allowing you to create value anymore or this, the business, the sustainable uh, Funding model doesn't work. So you take your assets, your infrastructure, your capabilities, and you move to a new area that's different, but close by. So in England, uh, on an island of Jersey, the post office workers, you know, there, a lot of people aren't mailing things anymore, but they used to visit the same people every day for, you know, 30 years. So now they're doing home care. So they pivoted. Uh, they're checking on wounds. They're doing IV. They're just doing check-in of the elderly and they're trusted. 
Uh, Louis Vuitton has a restaurant. Taco Bell, which is a really nasty Mexican food, fast food in North America, they have a hotel. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of health insurance plans are now getting into food delivery, transportation. This is not insurance. This is service. And then, of course, uh, malls where people shop are dying. Nobody goes there anymore. They're all being reinvented into elderly care, co-working space, short-term office space, etc. cetera. Um, flip the roles. So you guys heard of flip the classroom. In medicine, we say flip the visit. So uh, you do all the knowledge sharing before the visit, and then in the visit, you actually solve problems. So this big charity in the U.S. that used to, uh, you know, have a, a really sad commercial on TV, and they get people to give money to sponsor one child in Africa or Kenya or wherever. Now they're saying, no, no, no. You apply to be a sponsor, and we show your profile to the children, and they pick you. <laughs> they decide if you're going to sponsor them varied and this is the most significant business model innovation this charity has had in over a hundred years it's a catholic charity um another big one is is very unusual partnerships the the more um you know bizarre or odd the partner you have in healthcare i think the more dangerous things you can do so there's a small town in canada about an hour north of here with a population of 40,000 people that's not small in the Netherlands, but here it's small. Um, and they can't afford a bus system or a transit system or a train system. They don't have enough people, but people need to get around. They're very poor. They're very old. They asked Uber, can you come and help, you know, be a car service? And Uber said, no, your market's too small. Like, we're not going to make any money. Instead, they designed a different offer with Uber where Uber uh, drivers from the city can take people around. Uber still gets paid whatever it has to get paid, but the city pays for the amount that they would have spent if you took the bus or the train, $5 per trip. So the city is paying for, um, uh, sorry, sorry, the citizen pays the 3 or $5 and the city pays the rest. They got major uptake in the first year they'd never expected, like 45,000 trips. A uh, uh, last couple... Uh, another way of partnering, this is a grocery chain in the UK that partnered with academics to redesign the layout of the supermarket in a completely new concept that really makes choice of the right things to eat better. Uh, the grocery chain would have never been able to do it by themselves. Um, new payment models. So you probably saw the, the announcement a few months ago. So everybody loves to criticize pharma companies because they make a lot of money off medicines, and we know that right now. Um, it, uh, with one of the malaria and leprosy medicines, Novartis said, you know what, we need a lot of money to make these medicines. So they raised some debt. Um, they had to borrow some money to, do the, to finance the development. And, but they raised a bond, a debt that is, um, the interest will go up on their debt. They have to pay more interest. If they don't, get their medicines to people with malaria and leprosy. So they have a major incentive to do this really well. Imagine if Pfizer and Moderna doing their vaccine right now have to pay more money if the vaccine doesn't get to people. That's the idea, right? Very, very uh, risky. And that's kind of similar to most other impact bonds. And then finally, and I love using my Netherlands example, I use this all the time in your country of how you keep closing your prisons because you don't have enough prisoners. That would be the same as how do you close your hospitals because you don't have enough patients. So, you know, at the end of the day, any social care org or healthcare organization should be in the business of putting itself out of business. Like, you know, you've succeeded in as a sick care organization if people don't need you anymore because you've made them healthy. How can you make that your business model? <laughs> okay, hopefully those were some ideas. Now I want to go to the chat and I just want to see what are people, what's inspiring you from what you heard um, of what could be a, a, a different way to tackle some of these big, big problems in society. What are we seeing? I saw that uh, Rwanda, you said uh, the health experience designer. I love it. Can you, can you tell a little bit or... Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. One thing we're working on right now, and oh, sorry, she's gonna say her idea. 
Or does she want me to explain the, the idea? Yeah, maybe Rwanda first can explain uh, if she had an idea yeah. about it. Uh, yeah, I thought about um, doctors are, are trained to make the body better, but not really the well-being better. So I thought if you make it a health experience designer, the focus shifts from making the body better to making more well, making the well-being of the patient better, which yep. does not have to mean healing the disease. Yep. So um, language, the words you use in healthcare really, really matter. And that's, you could see from... Um, Helen's talk earlier. So imagine if we stopped using the word doctor, because it carries a lot of history, a lot of baggage. And we know that what most doctors do today doesn't match what they used to be, what they got trained in medical school anyway. So changing the words really could change your mindset. The words you use is your brain. So that's something I'm working on right now. One of my biggest projects, we're working on a new language that is the way we're going to talk at my company. And we're, we're going to ban the word frontline staff. So just like uh, B Helen said, frontline is the military. It's got a whole... So we're not using the word staff, workers, nurses. We're calling our team care designers. We're actually doing that. It's a completely different expectation of their role. So I think it could be very powerful. Any other ideas from the examples? We have one um, yeah, uh, group. Oh, sorry, uh, Miro, you can. Okay. Um, yeah, so group four, uh, their project is about waiting lists. And I think your story uh, really resonated with that project. Uh, uh, Eric is saying, uh, because their title is called Waiting Lists Are Great. Um, <laughs> so uh, actually, Eric, I don't know if you feel comfortable um, uh, explaining what you just wrote in the chat uh, about like a, a payment uh, system where actually it, uh, it pays off for the patient to, um, to be on the waiting list. Obviously, I, in an ideal world, world you get uh, helped immediately, but if that's not possible, then there's a financial benefit to you. Uh, yep, like you know, IKEA. Uh, like Ikea, Eric, yeah. do you want yeah. to elaborate on it? So uh, in, uh, in Holland, you, you first have, uh, you have a... a I can buy that. How do you say that in, in English? You have yeah, a, a fee you have to pay before you get, you know, yeah, you know, a copay. Yeah. yeah. So um, my my idea yeah. was when 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 you're on the waiting list, you get ten euros per day yeah. back, back. So you won't get help. And um, when uh, when it's when it's done, then um, you can choose where you want to be uh, treated and you can choose uh, any country where you want to be treated and if that's uh, impossible you can um, stay in a hotel each weekend until you're uh, you're getting getting help yeah i love it i love it this whole waiting thing you know um, like the word patient ah. what does it mean patient yeah. <laughs> We wait Be and patient, we yeah. wait. And then, uh, you know, the idea that a hospital builds an entire part of every clinic called the waiting room, it implies like that's just the expectation. You wait. Um, and then so I remember before COVID, uh, a lot of um, some innovative orgs are eliminating the waiting room. They're redoing their whole processes to eliminate wait. And people thought that was crazy. Like to them, there's no way. Now with COVID, you, there is no waiting room. You're not allowed to sit in a room, at least in Canada. You, you can't wait in a room for an appointment. You have to wait in your car. So they did do it. They eliminated the waiting room without a big project. And, you know, they just did it. Hello. So I like it. Okay. One more and then we'll move on. Any other ideas? I don't see anything in the chat right now. Okay. Can I can I ask then one uh, quick question? Um, if that's uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I will, I'm just wondering who carries the risks of of um, systems like this because we sometimes hear of the wrong pocket problem that the person or the organization who invests uh, doesn't always uh, that the returns of that investment fall to uh, another organization or another community. So maybe the council invests in people's well-being, but the healthcare system benefits 
from that because people don't get sick. So how do you, who, who carries the financial risks of these alternative um, financial models? Yeah, and that's where if you saw some of the examples, and I know the Netherlands is ahead on this, what these kind of impact bonds or outcomes-based payment models, um, they solve for that. Because you've got a, some kind of an independent evaluator that actually quantifies that, you know, health was created or whatever is the outcome. But that includes then the payment for creating that outcome has to go back to the person who did the intervention. <laughs> so that's the idea of these new payment models. You move the money around, but you have to have an objective, independent way to confirm that the results were created. Uh, Right now, doing that is a very, very difficult. It needs a lot of hours, a lot of people. There's not good skill. Soon, it'll just be normal. It'll Just like those examples I showed from the very first one of data as a service, imagine before technology how hard it would be to pay you and me every time a drug company uses our data to you know, make better drugs. Now they can do it like all with an IT system. So it's going to get easier and easier because all the data will be digitized. Okay, so let's move on. So I'm going to share these slides. I'll put them in the chat afterwards. Uh, these 14 business model innovations, my advice to you, keep them handy. And every now and then go through them. You're going to get new ideas before you do a project or maybe you do a workshop in your organization. They're very, very helpful. I've done things with the most conservative, closed-minded organizations in Canadian healthcare. And after 14 slides, they're coming up with ideas that I would have never imagined. <laughs> and it's extremely liberating to have some space to do that. So the last few minutes, just an update on a little bit of what I've been up to since coming back to Canada. So as I said, I'm on, I lead the futures team of SE Health and I'll explain what that is. And so I'll tell you a little bit what we're doing and then uh, a little bit about our book, The Future of Aging. And, uh, and as a present to the school, I'll give you a digital copy of my book. It's not an ebook, it's like a PDF of a book. <laughs> so it's not great to read, but I think it'll be nice. Uh, of course, if you wanna order the book, I won't complain, you can go buy it on Amazon. Um, but you know, when I came back after teaching and building the school, I really said, if I'm going to do innovation in a Canadian health org, I have to do different and I have to practice everything I just preached about. And, you know, we know from the guru of, of business model innovation, Clay Christensen, that the worst place to develop a new business model is from within your current. This is why healthcare has a very hard time doing innovation. Because, you know, usually it's easier if you're a new player, that's a startup or Amazon or Apple or Google, because you don't carry any of the old stuff. But it's not impossible. So I built our, um, our little futures team to really do, you know, it's what Helen said, we work on the edge. So the core is the, you know, my organization, 112 years old, we do transactional home care, hasn't changed, commodity, a very difficult organization. And, you know, because people are getting old, we were growing. My futures team is tiny, even smaller than this dot. And we work at the edge, one leg in the core, in the old company, one leg out in the future. And we keep doing a dance between the two. And we're building the new offerings, the new services, the new products that right now is going to be really, really small compared to the core. But I believe it's going to take over. We're going to basically put the old business out of business. And that's the renewal you need in healthcare. Uh, and that takes courage and it's hard. And guess what? I'm failing, but I'm trying. Um, and so that, if you're going to do that, you need a very clear view of what are you going to focus on when you do innovation. And so just to show you one of the frameworks, this is from Ralph Christian Orr um, in, in, in Germany. He has a, a great dual innovation management system that says, how do you, you know, keep fixing the core, optimize the core at the bottom, while also creating the new that's going to put the old out of business. That's what I'm trying to do. So that's kind of how I frame it. So anything involving the everyday and innovation in the company, that's our digital team. We have a clinical innovation team. That's that innovation team. My team only works on either redoing the core, really evolving our business model, or creating completely new things that never existed before. 
either new to our company or new to the world. So just to show you a different way of the same thing, if you think of how much are we changing the business model from what we do today in the core against how much are we bringing a new capability, a new technology like AI or virtual reality or drones or whatever, um, uh, my team works in that kind of top right area exclusively, which means out of 100 things that we get asked to work on for innovation, we say no 99 times. That sticks in the core. That's not us. The rest of the company needs to do innovation all the time, not us. We work on the really, really different stuff that needs to protect some space to play and do things very differently than if we did it within the organization. So I, I can share a lot more, but basically our methodology goes back to the definition of business model innovation. Every project, everything we work on, we're constantly looking on uh, desirability, which means do people want it? Can we create value? That's our human-centered design. That's our discovery. You know, all the stuff you guys are learning in the school. Uh, but that's not enough. At the same time, we have to make sure we can make money <laughs> so we can be alive and pay the bills. That's our capture value. So we're constantly experimenting on the payment model, the financing. Is there a market? How are we going to get to that market? And then, of course, we have to operate. We do care. We have nurses. We have physiotherapists. <laughs> if we can't deliver, there's no point. So that's all the training and the IT systems and the um, new mindsets and all that stuff and legal and privacy. And we have to work on all three at the same time. And, you know, you enter from desirability. If the thing is not so new that people want it, who cares if it's viable and feasible? but you're constantly working on all three all the time and iterating, iterating. This is very difficult work. That's why you need training, like the, the innovation school. Uh, and then finally, just a little bit about our book. So it's not only me as the author, my CEO, who's a very good friend of many people in the Netherlands, uh, some of our clinical team, our research team, and more. And we partnered with an innovation design firm called Idea Couture. And we really wanted to write like the Bible of where is aging going in society? What's happening? What are the signals? What are the trends? Uh, and this is like our guide for my team. This is what helps us make our choices about where we spend our time and where we don't, because we want to design for the future of elderly care, not for the past. Uh, and after looking at, I think, 400 signals, um, we uh, the pattern of the data in our research for the book was five themes. So we didn't decide these five chapters before. We let the data tell us that there was, you know, some themes around aging and community. So that's housing and uh, design of neighborhoods and streets and all that. So the chapter one is about how you live as an older person. Chapter two, of course, is about healthcare. Chapter three is all about technology and aging, not just health technology, we call them gerund technologies. So all these new tools to augment life. Chapter four is about money, <laughs> how you spend money when you age, save money, uh, work, retire, everything about the economy of aging. And then chapter five is all about uh, aging and identity. So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and maybe we'll kind of end with some conversation. Um, so just to summarize again, business models haven't changed. Uh, that's why it's very difficult to change. Um, if you don't evolve your business model, uh, you will go out of business. So no organization can outlive a, a business model that no longer works. Remember, that's either how you create value, capture value, or deliver value. If one of those three no longer works, you're going to go out of business unless you change it. Um, uh, I firmly believe if you're going to do business model innovation in a big, complex health system, you need to have a separate space, uh, like a lab or a greenhouse or whatever. That's what we do. Um, if you're doing innovation, you probably need what I call a portfolio, a little bit of those three, like the core, the adjacent, and the new. A lot of innovation teams do what's easy. They only work on the core, and I think that's very dangerous. Um, um, the methodology, the tools are, you can learn them for business model innovation, but doing it is very hard. And that's why I say it's the unfinished business of healthcare. You need a new set of muscles, <laughs> new mindsets, 
Uh, and, and this is so new that I say the antibodies of the company are going to come and eat you because they want to get rid of this foreign agent, you know, just like a bacteria in your body. So that's why you need a lot of good training. Um, and finally, here's my big idea. And maybe this is where health innovation school goes next. I think we need an R and D center of research and development, just like there is for drugs and devices. We need that just for business models in healthcare. We need a way to test new business models like over and over and over again. And, and right now that's not happening. So, okay, that's all I wanted to share. We could maybe uh, end with any final questions or discussion.